It's time for Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. And boy, do we have a great show for you. Mary Jo gets a sit down with Mr. Microsoft himself. Paul Therott gives an impassioned plea for a Windows Mobile flagship. And we don't talk enough about Windows 10. Windows Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 422, recorded July 15th, 2015. Nadella Unplugged. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. With one simple integration, you can offer your customers every way to pay, period. To learn more, and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash windows. And by IT Pro TV. A good IT Pro is always learning, and IT Pro TV is the resource to keep your IT skills up to date with engaging and informative video tutorials. For a free 7-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash ww and use the code ww30. It's time for Windows Weekly. It's the show that scoops up more Windows metadata than the NSA. With me, of course, is Paul Throt and Mary Jo Foley. And uh, Paul, you you just got back. Where where were you? I was in New York. Was this a fun New York? That was no. It was meetings, work Ooh. meetings, and mm. yeah, my hair is all messy. And <laughs> I had to run from the train to get here. You just got off a train. It's like hundred. I was supposed to be back in forty-five there. minutes ago, but I guess the train was late. I didn't even notice. And so as the time was going, I was like, "Hey, aren't we supposed to be there?" <laughs> well, of course, Paul so kind of a rush. is the brain behind the Win Super Site. He gives us <laughs> all, such as it is, such as it and is. And it's therot.com. Therot.com. And uh, on my other side here is the uh, the woman of the hour, the person who has come down with the story that essentially every Windows tech blog is parroting, dissecting, mm. turning into analysis. Mary Jo Foley from ZDNet's All About Microsoft blog. Mary Jo Foley, it's great to see you again. Thanks, Padre. Same here. I'm in. I'm in a really weird space here. I'm in the Orlando Convention Center here. So sorry for the weird acoustics. I'm in a big, huge, empty room with a small table. <laughs> well, you look good and you sound good. So obviously good, they've good. got a good connection good. because good. Uh, that's damn. That's quality. Good. Now, uh, of course, we need to talk about the top story of I'd say the week, maybe even the month, especially as we're getting closer. I'm closer actually to the not release. positive that the Xbox controller story is the big one, but you know what? Let's go with it. <laughs> you just you stole my joke. I was gonna do that one. Oh well. <laughs> Sorry. No, Sorry. no. But but of course it's the fact that Mary Jo Foley got some sit down time with Sacha Nadella. Now Mary Jo, okay, set the stage for us. How do you get a sit down with with Sacha? Okay, so I'll give you a little funny insider baseball about this. So Friday this past Friday, around 5 p.m., I see someone's calling me on my phone from Microsoft PR. And my first thought was, oh, man, they waited till Friday at 5 to do more layoffs this week. And I so I picked up the phone and I was like ranting at the person who, who called. And the person said, wait, 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 why do you think I only call with bad news? And I said, because you only call with bad news. And then the person said, well, I'm actually calling to see if you want 30 minutes with Satya Monday when you're at the Worldwide Partner Conference. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, so that's how you get it. They just bestow it upon you like a, like an offering. They just, yeah. <laughs> yep. You've so, been knighted. Yeah. So this wasn't something that you requested. This wasn't something that you were in a pool for. They just out of the blue called you and said, you know what, we, we need to get our story out there, and Mary Jo is, is a great person to do it. Well, you know, I ask for the for people all the time. I, I asked for Terry Meyerson here. I, I've asked for Satya since he was appointed CEO, and you always get, he's really busy, there's no time, blah, blah, blah. So you never know when you're going to get somebody like that, so you just keep asking. And then suddenly, boom, you get them. Uh, when they set something up like this, uh, how specific are they? You, you're here at this time, and we'll give you a pass and meet this person, and how many layers yeah. of security do you have to go through in order to have actual sit-down with the man? 
Well, this was really funny too. So um, originally I was supposed to come and meet him in a private room at the convention center after he finished his keynote, but his keynote was running long. So I, I got a message from someone who said, we're going to come find you in the audience and we're going to sneak you backstage to the green room so that when Satya comes off the stage, you'll, you can be in the green room to interview him. So they came, they got me, they snuck me under the curtain in the back during the keynote. Um, in a non-distracting way. But it was really funny when I went backstage because backstage is only for Microsoft people with special press badges and all. And um, people who saw me, who know know me from Microsoft, they were like, hey, what are you doing in here? What the, what the heck? We're security, you know? <laughs> so um, it was funny being backstage. I had never been backstage for a keynote before. So that was that was kind of amusing. Wait, did, did they give you an all access pass badge? No. No. No, they just snuck me back with my press badge on. So that was kind of weird <laughs> that, sh that should have set off all sorts of bells and whistles for people so. back there oh okay i mean i was escorted it wasn't like i was running around by myself but yeah <laughs> it's nice to be escorted into a building as opposed yeah. to out escorted of a building out. wasn't it exactly exactly i have a lot of experience <laughs> with the latter not so much with the former so. yeah okay all right so so you're back in the green room and sure. i'm assuming he comes in a couple of minutes later his handler tells him okay this is what you're doing right now and he sits down and you start the interview what's going on yeah so you know sometimes when you do these kind of interviews often i would say there are all these ground rules before you start it's you can ask him about this but you can't ask about this and he won't take questions about this and you guys can't even talk about this and what was very interesting about this interview they said you can talk to him about anything you want you've got Whoa. 30 minutes do it on anything you want really that yeah that never yeah. happens that never happens that never happens. <laughs> so, so you didn't have to you didn't have to submit your questions in advance. Nope. There there nope. were no ground rules. They basically no said, "Here's rules. the guy. You uh, you've got 30 minutes. You can ask him anything you want." Yep. And you know that's good and bad. It's great because you're like, "Wow, I can ask him anything I want." But then you're like, "I only have 30 minutes, and I don't want to waste it." Right. Um, so what what should I ask him about? So I I before the interview, I was sitting there drawing up a list of potential questions, and I'm not kidding you. I had about 50. Um, that I had on my list, but I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to get to ask about 10 at most, probably around eight. So I have, have to really prioritize uh, about what I want to ask. So that makes it harder because you're thinking this is my one big shot at talking to the CEO. Like for me, I'm like, should I ask him about Hadoop? You know, like you would, but no, I decided to ask him about mobile and the layoffs and Windows phone, because that's, that's the thing most top of mind right now for people. So I decided on that. So this this was really a this was Sacha unplugged. Was there, was. was there was there somebody else in the room to call off a question if it got too hot or? Yeah, yeah. There there was a PR person uh, with me, you know, but that person did not direct the conversation in any way, in any uh, way at all. That's so, so weird. Paul, I know it was Paul, great. Have you ever have you ever had access like that to any high level uh, official at Microsoft? Um, yeah. I mean, not. Not the CEO, but I've, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I was, it's funny because it, it, sort of thinking about Mary Jo talking to him, you know, of course you think, you know, what would I do in this situation? Or And what what I come to is I'm not really, he's not my kind of, I, I, like talking to him is not the type of thing that I should or would do, you know. I mean, I, I years ago I talked to some of the guys from the original NT team, Mark Lukowski, David Thompson, uh, and some others. And, and to me, like those kind of guys are more aligned with the stuff that I'm very interested in, you know, and I, I think the interesting thing about what Mary Jo was able to do was I actually do care a lot about Windows Phone. So actually on that day, it would have been a good day for me to talk to him because I have lots of questions like she did and she asked all the right questions. Um, but I, I mean, I, you know, people are, oh, you, ever, you know, have you ever met Bill Gates? You ever met, you know, like, but it's like, I, th that type of thing is not my yeah, you know, it's not, not it's not deal. your it's not your area. And you've interviewed yeah. people who I I wouldn't be like, okay, yeah, give me give me you know the head of Xbox or whatever. That would be useless, right? What am I going to ask yeah. him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could ask him, what's Xbox? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> what is this thing? <laughs> Mary Jo, did did you experience any pushback? Were were there any questions that you asked that you felt that you were getting sort of a okay, this is not a, an area that we go to w politely? Not we're not answering that, but. Uh, let me give you a, gen a generic answer so that you know that that's something that you shouldn't ask again. Um, going into this, I thought I was going to get a lot of that. And so I tried to phrase my questions in ways that were going to make um, more concrete answers and less philosophical answers. How 
Nadella answered me, you know? So I, I thought a lot about how to word the questions. And, and, you know, I have to say, I thought he was very direct, as direct as you can be as a CEO for the most part. I mean, there were some places where he kind of went off into more philosophy and, and corporate thinking, but for the most part, when I said, you know, what are you going to do with Windows Mobile? He answered me very directly. So I, I actually didn't feel like he made anything totally off limits, which again is very unusual based on other interviews I've done in the past. Okay. Well, let's say one thing that I thought was complete. Oh, okay. Go. I, I just, Only one. and I love this guy, but the notion that he decided to make windows 10 free to help windows phone yeah. is absurd. That's absurd. But wait, I, wait, but I, I mean, his, his justification that. is pretty good though. I mean, I, I follow no. the logic. No, there's no logic. <laughs> there, there's, <laughs> if you said Windows 10 sits at the center of a big universal apps platform that benefits embedded devices, phones, and phablets, and mini tablets, um, Internet of Things devices, Surface Hub, HoloLens, Xbox, on and on it goes. And that by, you know, making developers write apps that focus on this one platform and then seeing how easy it is to get this stuff out to all those other platforms... Thus, it made sense to make Windows 10 available for free as an upgrade. That would make some sense. But specifically picking out the one part of that whole ecosystem that is completely falling apart at this time, at this in this point in history, and, and claiming that that is the one, you know, that of, that of all those, that was the thing that made it make sense to make Windows 10 available for free on PCs. I mean, it's just not, it's just yeah. not believable. Well, and I, Mary Jo, I, I, did, I wasn't there, and I didn't yeah. hear the, you know... But you can re you can read it in her interview transcript. She said, "Come on, <laughs> like that doesn't make sense." I, but you know what? I I wanted to let him say his piece, and and that's mm -hmm. the thing. You, you know, like in these interviews, the way to derail an interview like this is you say to the person, "That's a bunch of crap," right? Or or you say it politely, like, "I totally yeah. don't believe you." Like you have to kind of weigh, like, where am I oh, going to no, push course. back? Of course. Right? right, right. So I also thought that was very odd that he said that too. But, you know, I took it more as he was making the pitch for universal apps in a way, because the, yeah. the Microsoft universal apps pitch is, uh, if we get people to develop for one of our platforms, they'll develop for others because it'll be fairly easy to, to, once you write the core of the app to move it to other places. So I'm like, maybe he's trying to make that is the case. So I, I kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt on that answer. <laughs> Sure. But I, I thought it fit in with the answer Did he you? gave about comparing Microsoft to Apple. And Apple's early strategy yeah. was the whole idea of we're going to expand the screens. We're going to own screens, starting with the, the laptop, the, the desktop, move to the mobile devices, move to the, the media devices. And that worked out pretty well for them. And there was, that very, there was a great quote. In fact, my favorite quote out of your interview was that, uh, what was he? Oh, exactly. You've got to remember even the Apple regeneration started with colorful mm -hmm. IMAX. So let us first get the colorful <laughs> IMAX. I think with that, that's what we're doing with the Lumia. Okay. We're I'm, at that stage. I'm sorry. Uh, but that's once BS2. Again, uh, <laughs> that's, but that's, I, I mean. <laughs> but why? It, because it doesn't follow that just because this happened over there that it's going to happen to us now. You know, Microsoft, Kevin Turner uh, made this, I think uh, Sasha might have said it in Mary Jo's interview as well, made it maybe a more relevant comparison, which was, you know, we had a $900 million write down on Surface. Everyone was making fun of this thing. We couldn't sell them. We had them sitting in warehouses, whatever. Mm -hmm. Come out with Surface Pro 3. We actually listen to customers. We do the right thing. All of a sudden, it's a success story. It's a billion dollar business. There's the model we follow, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but, but I, think he, I think he was trying to like draw an analogy that people might remember right so oh. so you're like okay <laughs> this is a remember Microsoft. i don't okay. know i remember when apple came out with the colorful imax and i was like you know what I, I, in fact i think i was even at an apple keynote where that was announced and i was like wow mm -hmm. do people really think colorful imax are like a big woo yes but well, they did no, but i'm sorry <laughs> uh, but the reason but the reason that doesn't make sense is apple's success since then has had nothing to do with an imac they right. invented new product categories. They came up with an iPod and then an iPhone and then an iPad and yeah. then an Apple Watch or whatever. It's not the Mac. If, if, if Apple was just the Mac company, as successful as that business would, is, they wouldn't register well, as wait, wait, the global okay. force in consumer electronics that they are today. Uh, Apple, yes, Apple did invent new product ca categories, but that came years after the groundwork. And the groundwork was with the iMacs because that established Apple as a company with style. Didn't matter if you liked their stuff or not. It looked good. <laughs> no, it, 
I and then when they what finally got is, the good hardware, then people are like, okay, style yeah. and good hardware. Yeah. I, I could okay. see Sacha saying the same thing about the Lumia. The, the Lumia is a beautiful device. Mo My Windows is, Mobile though, is a beautiful device. It just hasn't caught up in those other areas yet. That's nice, but <laughs> Microsoft has a beautiful product called Surface okay. that they can and should use as the example of what to follow. Yeah. And they okay. have done that elsewhere. I just find the Apple comparison to be somewhat presumptuous um, because... This is like hinting at, you know, we've got hardware stuff in the works. We're going to be like the next Apple. And I don't think following Apple has worked out for Microsoft over the years. You know, in fact, I think part of the problem that they're in right now is because they were following Apple too closely. <coughs> Zoom. <coughs> Not just Zoom. I mean, Windows Phone. Right. But no, when, when he, again, when he said this, I, I guess I didn't take it as a literal, like, we're trying to be like Apple when they introduced the colorful iMac. I took it more as, you know, remember there, there was an inflection point in Apple's history where they were down and out, and then they kind of had a point where they came up with something that regenerated them or got their yes. business restarted. I took it like that. I didn't take it as he picked a certain thing to because he wanted yeah. to say they okay. were like Apple. That's so I, I took it, by, by I took way, it a lot more broadly, I think. <laughs> I mean, if we want to beat the Apple thing to death, I'll also say that uh, part of the reason that that company was able to turn around is because they got rid of things that didn't make sense. In fact, one of the first things Steve Jobs did was look at the product lineup and say, no, 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 yep. no, no, no. And he ended up with yep. three or four products. Yep. That was it. Yep. And, and another big differentiator is the fact that for Apple, it was do or die. They were, I mean, they were literally a couple yeah. of months from going bankrupt. They right, had and to you come can up make those kind of decisions when you're in that position. Exactly. Microsoft is in no risk of going bankrupt in the next five years. Even if they, <laughs> no. they don't release another stellar product, they're still going to have a market share. They're still going to have billions of dollars. They could of take revenue. the same write down every quarter for the next five years, and it exactly. would be have no it'd be no danger of going out of business. Right. So they, yeah, yeah, they're not the plucky underdog, and they have no. a lot more inertia. There's a lot more resistance to change than Apple had when they were re reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. I get, now I see why your BSometer was going off. <laughs> uh, look, it, I I will say you know first of all, and I should say if I haven't said it right, Mary Jo did an awesome job. It was great. Oh yeah. There were all the right questions. It was excellent. Um, it's a lot easier the next day on a train to kind of sit down and start parsing sentences that are written down. Like I, I didn't hear how these things were said. I, you know, I, don't, I didn't have a vibe, a feeling for the vibe in the room and all that stuff. I mean, my job as a, an after the, you know, like a Monday morning quarterback critic of what he says is, is a very easy job, you know, I, and I want to be clear about that. I mean, uh, he has a hard job and he was speaking off the cuff and he yep. uh, had left himself open to any questions that she wanted to ask. I mean, we got to give him credit for that. I agree. Agreed. And I, I think the end of the interview is really fun because I, the one thing I saved up for the end was I had heard from some of my sources that he publicly, well, no, I shouldn't say publicly. He privately has told people in Microsoft that he plans to run the talk, to use the Talkman device, which is one of the new uh, premium Windows phones that are right, coming right. from Microsoft later this year. So I just said to him, do you use a Windows phone? And he's like, oh, of course I do, you know? And then I said, oh, do you have Sweet. it on you? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, is it the talk man? Because I heard you were going to use that. <laughs> and he's like, I never said that. And I am I said, well, publicly you never did. And he was a good sport. You know, he laughed. And then he pulled out the 830, which is his device. And he's like, no, this is my phone, actually. <laughs> so, you know, he he has, he's good. He, you can kid around with the guy. He's, he's a CEO. Even the of CEO company. of Microsoft can't use a flagship phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> They're having supply issues. Uh, uh, Mary Jo, let, let's dive a little bit in. Um, okay. uh, the second question that you asked after the whole, you know, thank you for coming. You just got off yep. stage. What happened out there? But you, you got straight into Windows Mobile and you asked for clarification on what it meant that they were going to focus. They were going to go down to the three types of models. They were, they were going to redevelop what it meant to actually have a Windows phone that was tied to the Windows desktop. What were your impressions? What, what did he give you? that say we didn't have last week on Windows Weekly with Dr. Pizza? Um, so he, he said very clearly, <laughs> uh, which, you know, it, it's funny. People said, well, they already said last week that they were going to keep making phones. Yes, they did say that last week. They said that they were going to have three categories that they were going to continue to support, which were the value phones, um, the flagship phones, and the business phones. But I think what, what I took away from it was he said very clearly, we are staying in the phone business. Boom. That's end of story there. But we're not just going to try to compete head to head um, with the people who have already established 
the market there. And instead, we're going to look for what's next and kind of where we can differentiate from Apple and the many different Android phone models. So it wasn't just, you know what, we're going to stay in the market. We're going to keep beating ourselves up and trying to build that 3% up to 3.1. It's That's not what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to recreate categories and parts of the market where they think they have a chance that aren't completely already dominated by those existing phones. So I think it's, it's subtle, but I, but it's to me, him saying on the record, what I want to hear as a windows phone user, which is, Hey, what, what we were doing didn't work and we're going to try something else, even though we're going to stay in the market. So I, I feel good about what he said. Uh, an interesting, interesting piece out of his answer is he acknowledged the fact that Microsoft doesn't have an iOS to OS X or a Chrome to Android. Uh, but the way he couched it was he said, look, we're, we're Microsoft, which means we're on everything from a tablet to the Raspberry Pi to the HoloLens. So we have to stop atomically dissecting every last platform and trying to make everything stick yep. together. It, 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 that is that the new vision for what it means to be a Windows device rather than just replicating the experience? It's just a brand and we'll make it as good as it needs to be for that particular device. Yeah, that, that's definitely part of it. Uh, the other part of it too, I guess maybe some people thought this was very obvious, but until he said it, I, I hadn't really thought of it this way. He thinks of the Windows mobile with a lowercase m mobile uh, ecosystem as including HoloLens and the band and surfaces, um, you know, maybe future surfaces um, that we don't have yet. So it, when he talks about mobile, you have to kind of clarify, is he talking about Windows mobile, the operating system that's going to be inside of Windows phones and small tablets? Or is he talking about this other ecosystem, which includes HoloLens and Band and, and these other devices, which are mobile devices, right? Because if you look at, um, I, I, I almost felt like he's saying, I don't really know which of these things is going to take off the most. And it's probably not Windows phone right now, but I think we have a good chance in the band and I think we have a good chance in um, the HoloLens, you know, and, and definitely in the surface. So I think, I think he's kind of hedging his bets and saying, I want the phone to take off. I want the phone to do well. I want us to do better than we're doing now, but that's not our only play as a companion device to the PC. And I guess to some people that would be very obvious, but to me, I was like, aha, right. I hadn't thought of it that way. What about it, Paul? Is that is that Microsoft actually refocusing, or is it just nice speak and they're still doing as many products as they it's, did before? He, I, I, the truth is, as far as the strategy goes, he didn't say anything different than what was in the okay. email, and except to say, you know, I didn't change the strategy, which is interesting because he uses there's a sentence in the email where he says, "I'm changing the strategy," and I, I, I what Mary Jo just said is absolutely correct, and, and I think. There's kind of a fundamental divide out here right now in the the Windows Phone community. These you know people who are very agitated right now uh, about what could or could not be happening to Windows Phone and so forth. Um, the Windows Phone market is not a big market. There there are going to be fewer Lumias. Microsoft only sees Windows Phone as part of its mobile strategy. Um, it wants to be on all mobile platforms, including its own, and it is, and it will continue to be so. And um, I, I you know I, I think what's changed is that. Microsoft has effectively given up on trying to be the third huge ecosystem and is instead focusing on some strengths that it might have, like she said, yep. like Mary Jo said. Yep. Uh, and, and I you think know that makes sense. Me too. And Paul, you, you, you're actually, you have been saying this. People just I know, think, you're, I know what, but people I'm, but think I'm, you're saying it in a negative way so that they're saying, <laughs> okay, right. I mean, so, I, I've so been saying this saying, all along. Well, I mean, I right. pointed to Continuum and at, I during WPC, they beat yeah. Continuum to death. Yeah. You know, uh, I, we're all, we're all on the same page. I mean, we I, are. we I, actually I, all are on the same page. We are. Yes. Um, I, I think the, the disconnect though, is that there are people who, uh, their heads are still in 2010 and they're thinking, well, maybe we could have 17 or 20 or 30% of the mobile market. And it's like, guys, right. it's not about market share in this case. They literally have given up on that. <laughs> Just, you know, they're, they're, it's not about competing broadly against iPhone and Android. They, they, they can't. But and, and just you know, as the Surface has established a niche in that market, they seek to do so with phones. Right. And, and if people are saying, oh, they're backing away because they're dropping the idea of fielding all these models. Well, guess what? That wasn't working. 
They were doing right. a phone a day almost, a new phone a day, and they were still stuck at that exactly. low market share. By the way, right? I, I, I was uh, talking with uh, Peter Bright uh, on Skype on the way home from New York, and, and mm -hmm. he, we, we kind of talked ourselves through what I think is an interesting story that somebody should write, which is that, you know, people have been complaining about the lack of, like flagships, for example. So it's very easy to say, well, you know, if they'd only put out a flagship in the past year, everything would have been fine. And the truth is, the flagship wouldn't have changed a thing. Right? No. I mean, the problem is there with their the way that they have to go to market. They can't put out a flagship that right. is just available <laughs> everywhere. So, the, the the interesting part, actually, the part Peter and I discussed that is maybe the most relevant is that I don't know if it was, I think it was um, I think it was actually two years ago, but a year and a half ago ish, Microsoft came out, or I should say, Nokia came out with the Lumia 520, which went on to be the best selling Windows device that year. Remember, yep. and. I, you, you have to sort of think that the success of that low-end device is what prompted them to say, hmm, low-end device works. Mm -hmm. Let's make mm -hmm. lots of low-end devices. But the weird yeah. thing is they followed it up with devices like the 530 and, uh, and other devices that didn't even have some of the same sensors, some of the same capabilities of the 520. So instead of sort of learning the lesson, great value, low price, it was like, how cheap can we make these things? Let's get rid of the camera button. Let's, you know, at a savings of five cents per unit or something. I mean, they started making really bad decisions and hammered too hard on one part of the market and it did nothing for them. And so, you yeah. know, I mean, I, I, negatively, I guess I could say that one, that strategy that didn't work is one third of their strategy this year I, or one fourth and it was three or four areas that they're focusing on. But um, I do think that it's important to to still, you know, tackle that market. I do think it's important to have flagships so that people like me and you and uh, yep. other enthusiasts have something to be excited about and show off to other people. And I do think it's important to focus on the business market, which is so crazy because when you go back to the original version of Windows Phone, I know it very specifically ignored the business market. It was an iPhone competitor. It was aimed yep. at consumers. This yep. has always been their bread and butter. I know. Um, yep. And so... You know, that, that was an interesting, phone? I mean, I don't know. Yep. That, that was an interesting point. Cause I, one of the questions I did ask him was about what is a business phone, right? Because yeah. when they announced that category, I'm like, what does that mean? You know? Um, so he talked a lot about, you know, it, for people who are in business, the big attractions are things like management, device management and security and protection, all those things. Right. But um, I heard he also is talking about when, when he's talking about those kind of devices, he means things like customized versions of Windows Phone that Microsoft might build for a particular vertical or a mm. particular customer. Even you know how they um, they did a deal last year with the New York Police Department where they outfitted their force in some places with Windows yep. phones. It's going to be like that. It's going to be like or airlines, custom right? Devices. How about an airline right. phone? Like that. It just has apps for the airline. Yep. That's what it's going to be like, I think. That's what a business phone is. And that's how a business phone will be different from a flagship phone. But that's, see, that's not a Microsoft thing. If, if, if your idea of a business phone is it has some really good third-party software that integrates it well with a flight system or a vertical system, mm -hmm. that's, oh. that's a customized phone. I mean, when I think of a yeah. business phone, when I think of an enterprise phone, I think of you give me a Windows phone that has so tight of an integration with my desktop, with my exchange, with all the apps I use in the office – that it doesn't make sense for me to, to try to duplicate that on an Android or an iOS device. They could have had that with yep. the first Windows well, by the Phone. Way, but they, they, they will have that with Windows Phone. I mean, I, I actually, I, and again, I, I don't really think this is a, a huge market, but there I think there is a market for this continuum type device where you're, you're walking with a phone or a phablet, whatever it is, and you come into work and you either dock it or just wireless or whatever, connect to a big screen, connect to a keyboard, connect to a mouse, and you basically have a PC. I mean, literally have a PC. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's hard not to look at that thing and say, that's Windows RT right there. <laughs> it's Windows yeah, RT I with know. a phone. Right. Um, that, it's very interesting. That, and yeah. I, I I do think there are business applications, and I don't mean literally like apps. I mean, uh, I do think there are, uh, businesses would be very interested in this type of thing because, you know, syncing is all, all, all well and good and everything, but I, the ability to just literally bring the thing with you is kind of neat. I mean, it should be cost effective to provide yeah. um, your employees with that stuff so they can bring it home and plug it in and get to work at home if they work from home. Yep. I no, think there's um, a neat. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Nadella actually to. said said during his keynote here at the partner show that his favorite Windows 10 feature is Continuum, and he's he. Then when we were talking in the interview, he he said to me, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like when you have a Windows phone that has Continuum and you can hook it up to big screen monitors and a keyboard, is it still a phone? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, or is it not a phone anymore? Is it some other new kind of device? And I'm right. like, yeah, right. hmm. I don't know. So he's he's definitely thinking along those lines. Um, you know, what what can you do when you go outside of the, of the typical, here's a smartphone, it has these set of features. What can Microsoft do that ha the other people haven't already completely dominated and done? And uh, something like the right. continuum on Windows Phone is an example, right? That's where they can differentiate. And, you know, it's, I mean, just to take a slight sidetrack, I mean, one of the, you know, not complaints, one of the suggestions I think we've seen from uh, power users, especially uh, IT pros and so forth, is really like what you're doing with Surface. And, you know, how about doing a Surface laptop? You know, I, I in particular have made this suggestion. Yeah. I would love to see mm -hmm. a thing like that. You know, and yeah. I, of course, I have my own weird requirements. I'd love it to have a much bigger screen than they'll ever do and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, maybe that's not the point, right? Because right. There are so many excellent Ultrabooks, right? But what there yeah. aren't are excellent two-in-ones like Surface. In other words, yeah. Surface has established this kind of a niche. You have to kind of wonder that, you know, when you think about Surface, right? Surface Pro 4, whenever it comes, it, it really doesn't have to be all that different from Surface Pro 3. They've kind of established that niche. I mean, mm -hmm. I think when you think Surface, maybe the next logical question should be, where's the, where's the mobile... Yeah. Surface device. Where's the Windows 10 Mobile Surface device? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Is it right. is that a phone, or mm -hmm. is that this kind of hybrid thing you're talking about? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, a continuum device, essentially, maybe. Yep. Mm -hmm. But that's that's what we want, right? Because the the desktop, the laptop is mature. Let, let's be honest. Phones are mature. Tablets are mature. If Microsoft wants to get out of the whole percentage game, the such a low percentage penetration into the phone market, they're going to have to make a new device. Um, yeah. And that hybrid market is still, we kind of know what it is, but it's definitely not mature. And there could be a lot of money there if you found that secret sauce of a nice small format device that also did all my telecommunications needs. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. I mean, and, right. and that's Windows 10. Yep. All right. Well, now, when we come back, we're going to dive deeper into Mary Jo's interview with Sacha Nadella. There's so much here. We've, we've covered one question. <laughs> oh, wait, how many how many did you have total in the interview? I think I had like seven or eight. Not bad, not bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, not bad. so uh, we, we're going to come back for some more Microsoft goodness. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a break and thank the first sponsor of this episode of Windows Weekly. Uh, let me reach out to all you developers out there. And let me ask you this. When you're making your mobile app, do you come to a point at which you need to monetize it? Well, of course you do. Everybody does. Now, whether it's you want to put a financial system in there so you can do in-app purchases, or or perhaps it's one of these apps where you want people to donate to a cause. doesn't matter what. At some point, you're going to want a connection between you and a source of revenue. Well, if you did it the old way, you'd have to stand up a server, maybe rent out some rack space, possibly make an agreement with a financial services company so that they can handle all the back-end stuff. And then you'd have to worry about potentially exposing your customers, personally identifying information, which is a nightmare that kills companies cold. Yeah, you could do all that, but why do it the way it was done 10, 20 years ago? Instead, just go to Braintree. Now, Braintree is the easiest way to add payments to your app. If you are a mobile app developer, you owe it to yourself to check out their V.0 SDK. It's the easiest way to add finances to your app. Now, they've made the payment experience in these apps seamless and magical. The ones that we have from Uber, Airbnb, Hotel Tonight, Living Social, and Muntry. If it works for those companies, it should work for you from your first dollar to your billionth. Now, Braintree gets you ready to receive payments quickly, and their continuous support plus fast payouts means that you'll be prepared at the start. Now, they're helping to solve the problem of mobile cart abandonment. If you've done any development, you know that this is a major thing. This, this is people getting to that last step right before they charge, right before they give you payment, and they decide, eh, I want to back out. Well, if your current payment processor isn't giving you tools to combat cart abandonment, they're not doing what Braintree could do for you. Now, it's just 10 lines, 10 lines of in-app code, and it's up and running and they support all different uh, operating systems from ios to android and including scripting they scaled with 
companies from their early startup stages to their billion dollar version so that you know that they can scale with you. Now, they give you a full stack payment, support for all payment types that your customers might want, which includes PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo cards, and more. Again, all with that single 10-line integration. And if you need help, they'll have a representative to guide you through the integration from step one to the end. So you'll never be left in the lurch with Braintree. Now, if you still have reservations about trying Braintree, let me give you one more reason why you might want to. You're going to get your first $50,000 in transactions fee free. Just go to BraintreePayments.com slash Windows. That's BraintreePayments.com slash Windows. Superior fraud protection, customer service, fast payouts. It's got to be Braintree. And we thank Braintree for their support of Windows Weekly. Mary Jo Foley, we're talking about your sit-down, your exclusive sit-down in the green room, 30 minutes with Sachin Adela. We've talked a little bit about Windows Mobile. What else did you uh, did you squeeze out of the time? Uh, let's see. What else did we talk about? I asked him about HoloLens uh, because there. I, I had heard a story back in January when we first saw the HoloLens uh, augmented reality glasses that um, Nadella himself, the first time he saw that technology went back to Alex Kipman, who is the brains behind HoloLens, and he said to him, you know what, you're thinking this is a gaming type peripheral. I think it should be something much broader than that. So I said to him, you know, I heard you went and said that to Alex Kipman. So I'm curious, when this comes out, do you think this is going to be the first V1 of HoloLens? Will it be mostly gaming and entertainment and kind of consumer-focused applications, or will it be business? And he was very definite. He's like developers and enterprise is where this V1 is going to be. Um, he, you know, he talked about, I, we did buy Minecraft. We've shown demos with HoloLens and Minecraft. But the place we think this is really going to take off when it first comes out is in um, very specific verticals like hospitals and retail, um, healthcare. He said they're seeing a lot of interest. And I thought that was very interesting too because I have said on this show many times, I consider HoloLens a gaming peripheral. Uh, and so this was a surprise. Oh, and no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody just sent me a note. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Now, uh, yeah, Paul, so uh, you've actually put the HoloLens on. Could you see uh, it being used in verticals like hospitals and campuses? Ugh. By the way, Mary Jo has too. I, in fact, I think we've probably had the same... I think we've had the same level of experience with it, but, um, yep. Did you try it though again in April? I didn't. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you've um, had more experience. Okay. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, a few years back, Microsoft had a promo video where they talked about connect and how it could be used. Like a doctor would virtually operate on someone remotely. And I, Anyone who's used connect would understand how absolutely positively ludicrous that little scenario is. Um, HoloLens has some inherent superiority to connect with regards to how rock solid the holograms are in your field of view. Uh, that they, you know, if something it looks like it's sitting on a desk, you can kind of bob your head around and move however you want. And that thing stays exactly where it's supposed to be in 3D space. And, and that, that capability uh, is so amazing to me that I have to think that, yes, it's possible, uh, unlike with Connect. Um, is it going to happen with V1? You know, I, I don't know. And we, we've talked about the field of view limitations and so forth in the shipping version of the product, um, of the first product. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. But uh, I was not surprised to hear about their focus for the first version of HoloLens. Um, I, I had trouble understanding how this thing could be used for gaming beyond something very simple like Minecraft or, you know, uh, the type of game we would have played, you know, many, many years ago, like the like, uh, Marble Madness is not the right name, but, you know, there's basically a marble rolling and it goes down and falls on things. And you could kind of imagine a, a holographic marble bouncing off of real world objects and it could be a game that was made out of that kind of thing. And maybe. Um, but I actually think that HoloLens lends itself to slower moving kind of researchy type things. And, um, you know, some of the demos we got in January and or uh, April I think speak to those capabilities. Um, the you know a Skype video of someone's helping you fix something on the wall, or 
you know, you're standing on the surface of Mars and you're telling people where the rover needs to go next or whatever. Um, I think that HoloLens actually does have a, a future for those kind of verticals. It has more legs than, than say, the Connect I mean, Because the Connect I more. mean, the Connect's an actual product. You can buy it today. You can interface yep. it with your PC just as well as you interfa interface with your game yeah. console. Yeah. Uh, the HoloLens, I mean... Well, okay, but the, the, the fear for HoloLens is the same as what the fear that you know, now we know has happened with uh, Connect, which is that it, it, you get very excited about it before you get it. And maybe the first day you have it, it's all very exciting. But then you sort of realize the limitations and it kind of trails off. And uh, I think, you know, the interesting thing about Connect is if we if they could just go back in time three or four years and say, you know, the thing that is really going to work is voice command. Maybe you should work on that stuff and forget the hand gesture baloney. Um, that might have been a very different product. I actually think the fundamentals with HoloLens are are solid, you know. Um, when I complain about the mail slot view on the field of view, um, I'm complaining about something because the rest of it is so awesome. You, you want to, you want to, you want to experience it in its full view. I mean, you want it to be that good, and I, it's not hard to imagine that it's not going to get there. So I think, by I think what they're going to do there is work very closely with individual. I don't want to call them partners. I guess they're customers essentially, and uh, whether it's robots on an assembly line or NASA or whoever it is, and and try to figure out the places where this thing actually solves a problem. And I think they are going to find those places. It's not, you know, it's not a mass market iPod type device. It's, uh, it's, it's a niche, you know, it's a vertical kind of thing. But I, I do think they're going to see success with it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy that they're positioning it that way, actually, because especially with the limited field of view thing, right? It, maybe in those kind of applications, it's not a bit, as big a deal as when you're trying to, you know, when they show that demo where you're watching TV and the TV's moving with you. Um, or you're trying to play a game. I think maybe yeah. it would lend itself better to that kind of thing. Mary Jo Paul, let me, let me ask you this. So you've you've both had the Hololens on the the version with the mail slot view. Mm -hmm. Is that mail slot view just a matter of cost? In other words, if cost was no object, does the technology exist? Can it scale up to give you the full view? Because that that will tell you whether or not that's actually going to be possible down the road. Because of course, the cost yeah. is eventually going to drop. I, I mean, I'm just, I can only speculate, but I, I think it's related to the fact that they want this thing to be tetherless. And I oh. I don't quite know why, because it seems like most, in other words, if they had come to market with a tethered holographic device for the first time, and then maybe Gen 2 or 3 came up with tetherless, I think that would have been a very natural progression. But I, I feel like they're artificially limiting its capabilities in one way. To have this other thing, which is tetherless, which I don't actually think makes a big deal or, or matters much to people who would use it as they will use it during this first generation. Especially if it's going to be used for a vertical. A vertical, you have no problem yeah, putting on like not, a, a lap belt and tethering it up. You're going to be in a room of some kind yeah. doing yeah. something. You're not walking down the street talking on your phone, you know, mowing your lawn or something. It's not that kind of device. Well, Paul, there is always that guy who will do that <laughs> yes. just, just because. Yep. yep. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, Mary Jo, one of the questions that I thought that you uh, you really nailed it on was when you started to talk to Sacha about partners, specifically mm -hmm. about how they were dealing with partners and the new Microsoft, because it's it's very different from how the old Microsoft used to deal with Salesforce and Adobe. Mm -hmm. What what was your sense? What well, how does Sacha think partners are going to be important for Microsoft in the next five years? Well, you know, if you if you remember. Um, people like Balmer and Gates, they were very antagonistic towards their competitors and very publicly antagonistic towards them and, and vice versa, right? So when Satya took over as CEO, you started seeing Microsoft do all these interesting partnerships with companies they had been fighting with before. So Salesforce comes to mind right away, Adobe, um, Box and Dropbox. Suddenly Microsoft's doing all these deals that People are like, what, what, what's happened? Everything's different now. So I, I tried to zone in with him on Google because I'm like, you know, the one you haven't done the partnership with is Google, right? In fact, you guys are fighting over in the EU in antitrust court. I didn't mention that, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I said, you know, is there any hope that you might partner with Google? And, and he said, you know what? I'd love for them to partner with us. I'd love to see YouTube on Windows Phone. I'd love to see them do more with like Chrome on Windows 10, right? Um, and so I asked, are you talking with them actively about this? And he said, we're talking to every developer. So he wouldn't go deep into, are we actually talking to them or not talking to them? But he's open to talking to them. 
And to me, that's the difference between the old Microsoft and the new Microsoft. The old Microsoft would be like, you know what? We're in a war with them. We're in antitrust court with them. We're fighting them. They're, they're one of our foremost competitors. We're not going to try to talk to them about bringing their applications over to our platforms. But Nadell is a pragmatist, right? And he's said, we would love to have that stuff because Microsoft's heritage is we're a platforms company. Platforms company means you have to get other companies to write software that runs on your platform. And in the past, the platform was Windows. Now the platform is Windows, Office, and Azure. So Microsoft's whole strategy going forward is let's get as many companies to write software for those platforms as we can. It's very pragmatic. It's not about vendettas. It's not about holding grudges. And, you know, you think, oh, it's a company. Of course, they're not going to be like people and, and hold grudges. But I can tell you, Gates and Balmer, yeah, they held some grudges. And it was pretty apparent that they held grudges. So I think Nadella is just like, you know what? We're, we're the underdog in mobile. We have a really massive share in, in desktop still, but we aren't just going to rest on our laurels. We're going to get these guys as much as we can to write for our platforms. And that's a very, very mature, I'd say, and different approach. Of course, we're lucky that Steve Jobs never held any grudges. Oh, right. Yeah. All. Well, let's... When you're talking about maturity. <laughs> He's held grudges from beyond the grave. I know, my goodness. Oh. I, the only thing I'd say about the Google thing, though, is, um, you know, he didn't really say they were talking to Google, and they're not talking to Google. I think, you know, they're clearly not talking to Google, and that stinks, you know, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of bad blood there, but um, I don't think we're ever going to see, it doesn't behoove Google to support the, the, the mobile platform, you know? I mean, are we ever going to see a version of iTunes for, you know, a universal app version of iTunes that could also run on phones? You know, no, no there's no way. I kind of hope not. <laughs> you know? Can't stand yeah. iTunes. <laughs> Especially on Windows, right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, I, I like to install iTunes on Windows whenever I like my Windows box to crap out. That's... Uh, sure. That's, well, that's I, I, I install it on my laptops to um, impede the battery life because I find that it lasts for too long normally. <laughs> <laughs> I know sometimes, you know, I, I'm sitting there going, this, this has been on battery for 12 hours. Is there a way I could half that? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's right, right. Let's, let's do yeah, that. It doesn't seem healthy for the battery. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I, I need both of you to help me out with this. Okay. Gig Jam. Now, I'm, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, Mary Jo Foley talked to Sacha about Gig Jam. What is it? Why am I going to want it? Why should I care about it? Okay, I would say let me do that as my enterprise pick instead. Okay. Because it's, we're going to get off on a really weird tangent if I start talking <laughs> about that. <laughs> uh, By the way, worst me. product name ever for Microsoft? Maybe? Like one of wow, the. Wow, really? Uh, <laughs> Bob, I mean, come on, Bob. I mean, well, we, you know, we kind of hammer on them for their terrible product names. They, they come up with something kind of cool for something that. Liked it? Actually is, huh. Okay. Yeah, it makes no, it sounds like a music product. It does. Yeah. Uh, what else can we mine out of your uh, your interview? I mean, obviously, people are mining a whole lot because there are now hundreds of pages that are just analyzing your analysis. But uh, if if there was if there's your takeaways, Mary Jo, what would your takeaways be? The things that you were most impressed about Sacha with the things that you think he cleared up the most past the email that we all received. Mm -hmm. What um, from 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 your mouth to our ears. <laughs> so I actually did a, a separate post where I said, here were my five things that I learned by talking to him that, or things that at least he crystallized for me by my talking to him. So I said, one of them, which I already mentioned was windows mobile is different from windows mobile with the capital M, you know, two different kinds of things that they're going for in that space. Um, I talked about pla what he means when he says platform, because you hear him use that word a lot. And I always thought he meant cross platform when he said platform. But in fact, he's actually, again, referring back to the idea of Microsoft as a platform company and that they want to get other companies to port to their platforms. Um, one thing that I didn't include in the interview, because I had to cut it for length, it was it was quite long. I, I cut out very little, I'll tell you, but I did cut out one part um, where we talked about um, this idea of bundling, right? Remember when, when Microsoft first was building the Office apps, they were all standalone apps and they weren't, and even Outlook itself, there used to be separate calendar and email and somehow Microsoft came up with this idea that, hey, you know what, if we bundled all this stuff into a suite and we called it Office, 
maybe that would help with adoption, customer adoption, and get office apps to have more traction. So I've been noticing lately that they've been doing a lot more bundling. They're bundling together all kinds of stuff. They have this enterprise mobility suite um, that they have now, operations management suite, the Azure stack, Cortana, Cortana analytics suite, which is Cortana mashed up with analytics tools. And it's like they're almost almost monthly or even more frequently coming out with these bundles of, of different services and apps. And we talked a little bit about that when I was interviewing him. And he, he said, yeah, that's definitely a strategy we have. We're going to be doing more of that. And I think that's very interesting because it's it's almost like lightning struck once with them doing that with Office and can they make it happen again? Um, so I, I thought that was kind of a, an interesting takeaway. Um, he also, you know, he has a very much broader, or at least he says he has a broader definition of operating system than um, what we currently call an operating system. I'm going to read that quote that he said, because I thought this was one of his best quotes from the interview. He said, um, it's very important to me to think of our operating systems more broadly than the old definition of an operating system. So we want to be in every device, not only have our application endpoints on every device. We want to have we want to have devices with our identity management, like MSA, you know, the Microsoft account, Azure Active Directory, managing the devices. Um, so he's he, when he thinks about operating systems, we think of it as Windows, right? But he's thinking about all these parts beyond what we call Windows as being part of what Microsoft calls its operating system platform. And again, it, you could say it's semantics, but I think it shows you kind of uh, where Microsoft's emphasis is going to be going forward. So I think those are my big takeaways. I also like the fact that uh, you you took away the f uh, that Microsoft wants to be ahead of the curve for once, which yeah. is kind of nice. It's it's a good yep. way to think. Paul, what yep. about you? If if you were going to do a takeaway from uh, from the interview, uh, aside from the fact that you've already given us some great points, what would it be? <laughs> well, I I think they're trying to help with the messaging a little bit. I mean, they announced some tough news last week. Um, obviously, there's some. Hard feelings over that in some quarters, you know, especially among Windows Phone fans. And I think they're trying to temper things. I mean, I, I spoke to people from Microsoft last week on and off the record and was basically told that, look, you know, we can't abandon mobile. We have to make devices. And and even if they're not successful, you know, we need to put these things uh, into the market. So given that, let me, why don't we just create great devices? And I think that's kind of cool. So if you love Windows Phone, uh, it's going to be around for a while. If you love Lumia, the, the, Microsoft's going to be making devices. Um, they may or may not be successful in the market, but we're at least assured for the time being that these things will be made. And I, as a Windows Phone fan, still think that Windows Phone has important advantages and will have further advantages with, with Windows 10 and with Continuum and so forth. So, um, you know, it's a, I think it would have been tough for Satya Nadella or Terry Myerson or anybody else to have come out on the day that they announced layoffs and say, don't worry, everything's great. But I think yeah. now that we've kind of got that behind us, now they can start laying out the, you know, the the path forward. And I think Mary Jo's interview with him was um, very well done, but also very timely. And I think it was a nice um, reminder that it's not all doom and gloom. I'm, I'm so happy that you say that because one of the things that I think has been a huge trap for Microsoft over the last 18 or so months has been that penetration number. Uh, yeah. And they've obsessed over it. And that's why, as you said, they started making cheap, crappy phones, turning something yep. that was beautiful into something that was like every yeah. other crappy phone that you had It was had like the they market. forgot what made them special. Right. You know? mm. It's like, yeah, mm. you know what? This is a Windows phone. Yeah, we don't have all the apps that you may want right now. But guess what? There is no hardware that's designed better. There's no camera that's more beautiful. There's no OS yeah. that runs as smoothly or as slick, slickly as this. I, I want to see that. Give me the flagship. Give me a couple of reasons why I need the flagship if I'm running Windows. Yep. And yeah, now now it's actually a competitor. Penetration numbers be damned. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Yes. Well, we got it all settled. Fantastic. Done. Everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> folks, this is the uh, last episode of Windows Weekly. Uh, <laughs> yep. Okay, well, let, let's move on to something that's uh, that I have actually started doing since the show started. I am uh, about 50% into the download for Build 10 to 40, mm -hmm. which is supposedly according to The Verge, is the RTM yeah. version of Windows 10. I have some exclusive information about that. Oh, go, hit me. And that is that it's not technically RTM uh, in the sense that Microsoft has not declared RTM. Um, 
But uh, this is actually confusing to people inside Microsoft, by the way, as well, because they're kind of used to doing things a certain way. So from the outside, it's like, what's happening here? Um, what I was told is that they have, in fact, stopped making new builds and that what they are now working on are, in fact, let me find my start because I have not posted this yet. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see. Oh, yeah, so that what they're building is what they call update packages for this build. So it, what this, the source uh, that I have is sort of suggesting is that they're kind of changing the way that they declare RTM. It's not just a build. It's a build plus some certain number of critical update packages. Oh. The interesting thing about this is I, I wrote that up. I wrote up what this guy told me. And then I read Gayball's blog yeah. post uh, announcing the build. And he actually suggests exactly what I just said. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, sorry. I, I already closed it because I was done with it. Um, sorry. We'll just take five minutes for the browser to come up. Please wait. <laughs> um, all right. So <laughs> what he says is that um, he says, uh, I'm just trying to find the exact wording because there's two sentences that relate to what I just said. Um, all right. It doesn't matter. I can't find the first one. But it says, besides builds, over the next two weeks, You'll also see some Windows updates and app updates in the store. So make sure to keep checking for updates daily to make sure you're running the latest and greatest code. It's very close to what yeah. my source told me about these critical updates. In other words, the, technically speaking, this, this is the build, but yeah. we're on this Windows as a service thing. So the, the build number doesn't matter. The thing that is RTM, the thing that will be in a box when you buy a new PC on July 29th or July 30th or whatever, is going to be, yeah, it will it will be this build, but it will also be whatever combination of critical updates complete it. Yep. You know, so in other words, in the past when they had issues, they'd rev another build. Now they've stopped building builds. And, and they're also, they're deprecating the importance of a service pack. I mean, it's not yeah. really a service pack anymore. It's just part of as a service. As a service, of course, there'll be updates. There'll be yeah. new features. There'll be bug fixes. That shouldn't... So, yeah, I, I guess... If, if this is a good tone to start on, if you want to mm -hmm. get people away from the whole, I have my operating system and now I've got five days of, of updates I have to apply. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, here's, how, here's how my source explained this to me. Um, build 102.4.0 is RTM. Mm -hmm. um, it's the build that Microsoft had to give to OEM partners because they have to give them something, they have right? To give something. Yeah. Um, so they're now rolling this out to fast and slow ring insiders right now as we're on the show. Uh, so if you're an insider, you can go get this bill too. And like Paul said, what's going to happen between now, July 15th, and July 29th, which is the start of the rollout, is Microsoft's going to keep updating the build, right? They're going to keep doing fixes for it and mm -hmm. updates. So when you get your new build on the 29th like when you as an insider you'll get those updates obviously on a regular basis but if you're a person who's going to be downloading the final code to your machine you'll get build 102.4.0 then you're going to get the updates that came between july 15th and july 29th also right so it microsoft doesn't want to say rtm anymore because when windows is a service rtm is kind of meaningless because it's always being updated, right? right. Um, the other interesting little thing that people are noting who are downloading this, um, the build is designated as TH1. Right. Um, and everyone's saying, what is that? I, my guess is threshold well, one. Threshold, of course. Right. But course. I think the one is yeah. this. First release. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Threshold two will be whatever that bigger update is when, when it comes in October or so. That's my guess. Oh, Windows 11, you mean? Yeah, what you call Windows 11? No, no, no. Uh, we're going. We're going straight to Windows 18. <laughs> Actually, that's that's a. Now, uh, Mary Jo, I know that you have not, by choice, installed any of the builds. You you not. you would like to have the RTM experience for the first time. Mm -hmm. Uh, yep. Paul, have have you done any of the builds, or actually, more importantly, <laughs> have you have you done the Windows 10 mobile preview? Yeah, I've installed every single build, including ones <laughs> Microsoft hasn't given out. Oh, nice. Okay, so you're not going for the Virgin experience. <laughs> well, well, that came out wrong. Mm. Let's see. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I need to test it in every possible situation. So I, I'm, I'm literally going to have some PCs that are just going to sit there ready to update when it actually comes out officially. But I have to, you know, it's, I'm writing a book about Windows 10. I mean, I need to <laughs> right. install it and write about it and, and see how it reacts in different ways. So I've installed it every way you can install it. So, you know, with this particular build, you can only get it 
through Windows Update. There's no ISO made available. There won't be apparently, although you know it remains to be seen uh, post GA. You know, general availability what they do with regards to that. Um, so this time, you know, I'm installing it like anyone would, just updating via Windows Update. Uh, let me ask you this: They say that on July 29th, uh, insiders mm -hmm. and everyone else will be able to download ISOs to get your update so that you can bump up your Windows 7 or your Windows 8 box. But then the Verge story also said you you can expect to start seeing new PCs with Windows 10 probably in two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. Why why so long? It's not like they're going to get a, a DVD master. They just they download the ISOs, load up the operating system, and they're done. Is, is this just channel? They're just waiting for the channel to turn out all the Windows 8 machines before? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I talked to Dell a couple of weeks ago now, and they were telling me, you know, th there's only so fast that a plane can fly. I mean, you got to there has to be some lead time, you know. Um, we've never had this kind of lead time before, by which I mean no lead time. So <laughs> it's going to be right down to the wire in many cases. So I, I do, I, I, uh, reports have switched around a little bit, but uh, supposedly there will be some PCs available on July 29th. There'll be some available the next day. Some people have pre-ordered PCs. They'll ship on the 29th and maybe they'll get them on the 30th. And then obviously availability will just expand and probably pretty dramatically uh, in the weeks to follow. Right. Bloom Bloomberg actually had a story out earlier this week where they said there would be no PCs out on July yeah. 29th. But then Microsoft went back to them and said, oh, we goofed. We told you the wrong thing. And that Dell, HP, Lenovo and Acer will have some machines with Windows 10 on them in stores on that day. So there yeah. will be machines with it I mean, on them. You know, imagine that uh, you, uh, imagine the PC makers just got it today. Right. right? July 29th is literally two weeks away. Yep. Um, they've been blasting builds onto the, these, this exact kind of hardware for a long time. They know it's going to work just fine. Uh, they'll do so. They'll do some testing. Uh, they'll package these things up. They'll put them on planes and they'll ship them to re, you know, to retailers or whatever. I mean, it's not, it, it's not hard to imagine that there'll be some PCs, especially from these big companies that can do things, right. um, you know, that smaller companies can't. Mm -hmm. Are we done with the Windows 10 news? I mean, it's it's exciting, but once Padre. we do RTM, we just Padre. wait. Padre. We'll never be done. Padre. We'll never be done. Padre. Yes. <laughs> We're never going to be done with Windows 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I stand corrected. I, I, I do never. apologize. Never, about, never, never. Can we move on from Windows 10 here? Yeah. Can more Windows 10. How about more Windows 10? Okay, we can do more Windows 10. Mary Jo. <laughs> well, you know, because we haven't actually talked about um, what happens on July 29th as far as the launch, right? In the past, you know, when Microsoft has launches, there's a big party, like a huge party or two somewhere in the world. There's all the talking heads and the executives and people come and we cover it as a news event. Well, they're, they're not having that this year. Instead, they're having what they're calling fan launches which hopefully won't be like those Windows 7 parties where people, what were those things called? Do you remember those where people had people over to their homes to install Windows 7? Do you guys remember that? I forget what they called that. I actually still have my house, house party kit. House party. It came okay. with, okay, wait, it came with a basic copy, a home edition of Windows 7. It came with yeah. the gold copy, which I still have. I haven't opened yet. And a mm -hmm. bunch of Microsoft themed party streamers. And we're not having that. We're not having that this time. Well, I'm having that. I don't know about you <laughs> well, guys. you're having but... it at your house? Okay, okay. No, instead they're having big parties in a number of cities. Um, Sydney, Beijing, New Tokyo, London, Berlin, um, Dubai, and New York. And they're going to have the fans come to the parties. And various people who worked on Windows 10 are going to be at the parties. There'll be demos and drinks and entertainment, blah, blah, blah. But that's it. There's not going to be a launch event on July 29th. And to me, this makes sense because this is kind of a slow rollout or a staggered rollout. The people who get Windows 10 on July 29th are the fans, they're the insiders. Normal consumers are gonna get it after that date in over a series of weeks. So it'd be very weird to have this huge launch and say, and you can't get the bits for another X number of days, right? So I, th I think they're doing it the right way. I think uh, this kind of a party thing is better. Party tools to build your guest list. Oh, I remember oh, this. No, yes. No. These, <laughs> this is exactly what and my party looked party like. Back. Though you're in your own home, you'll be able to participate with others in this exciting event. Actually, what my party looked like was me installing the, the giveaways on my computer. 
I, I'll easy. be honest about yeah, that. that is. <laughs> but we thought you'd probably <laughs> like to know what's just so to get bad. Ready. <laughs> some hosts want that party to flow. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Oh, I think I still have my Windows Seven party. balloons. Man, do you? collectors' yeah. items. Yeah, but they have the wrong, they have so the wrong branding on it. They have the the non straight window thingy. Really fun. Yeah. Now, of course, the first thing you want to do. Oh, Alex, take it away. Take it away, Alex. So Make sure you do that a couple days in advance of the party. Call customer service if you have any questions. How did anyone ever think that was a good idea? Before. Before. <laughs> Second, look at the I don't know. <sighs> <sighs> All right, so now we know how Windows 10 is going to be released. Now we know when it's going to be released. Uh, is there anything else we can milk that story out of? <laughs> oh, um, no. Paul, did you have anything more when you said t some of Terry's remarks from the partner show? Anything? worth no i mean actually he didn't really say anything <laughs> so I, really I would say that um Sacha's comments to you override what he said okay. because he did uh although you know a lot. I, oh, shoot. I have to give a shout out to the guy who did the demo of windows 10 at the partner show whose name is brian roper he stole the whole keynote that guy was amazing he he actually got the crowd that was kind of a little listless at that point, all revved up. And he, he was like a joke a minute. He was so good. He didn't have Joe Belfiore's haircut, but, you know, otherwise he was like the demo guy. I think he used to be a singer on a cruise ship and Microsoft hired him. Right. Which is a very unusual background. But he did a fantastic job, I thought, demoing the product. Got to give him a shout. Yep. How about this? Are we, are we, uh, Ready to start talking a little bit about the Surface because that's got me excited. I mean, we've been waiting for some news about when they're going to ramp up, and we finally have that. Uh, Paul, you know, might, might you be ready can, to go but there? Do you think we should talk a little bit about Windows 10? No. <laughs> I, don't. I don't think we said enough about it. Can we stop with that? <laughs> but okay, we're going to do all of that when we come back because right now I do want to take just a short break to, to thank the second sponsor of this episode of Windows Weekly. Uh, now, I, I get a lot of people. For in my other show, This Week in Enterprise Tech, who ask me about how they get into the world of IT. It can seem a little bit daunting. There's a lot of things that look like magic. There's a lot of things that look like you need to be playing with millions of dollars worth of equipment. And, you know, some of the older ways of getting into IT, of just tinkering and then maybe finding someone who's doing IT for a small company, they, they may not work for you. Uh, you may decide that you need to take a course, maybe a couple of certifications. And and sometimes those are good and sometimes they're not so useful. But if you want the best way to find all the knowledge you'll ever need about IT, if you want to find a way that you can follow along with a course schedule to, to get into the basics of what it means to work in this wonderful world of communications, well, you need look no further than IT Pro TV. Now, IT Pro TV, if you've ever been there, looks a lot like Twit, and there's a reason for that. It's because they actually came to the studio, they talked to Lisa, they talked to Leo, they, they used the same TriCaster and cameras that we do because they wanted to create a Twit army focused on IT, and I think they did a great job. Now, IT Pro TV is a video network that's dedicated exclusively to the world of information technology. Whether you're looking to jumpstart a career in IT or you're already working in the field, IT Pro TV supplements traditional learning in a fun and engaging way. It maximizes your learning, preparing you for certification exams, if that's what you want to do. They have hundreds of hours of content, now with two studios and 50 hours of content being added each week. They stream live and on demand to your Chromecast, your computer, or your mobile device. They've got a brand new iPhone and Roku app, now with the ability to resume playback between devices, so you could start on your desktop and move to your tablet, or maybe end up on your phone. They've also got a growing episode library with video courses on Apple, Microsoft, Cisco, and more, including A+, CCNA, Security+, MCSA, CISSP, Network Security, Linux, Windows, OS X, desktop support, servers, and more. I, I am actually very excited by a new series they have, the, the Ethical Hacker. It's Hacking Forensics Investigator and Cryptography course shot by Sean Philip Oriano. Ashan is a security expert who consults with enterprise and military organizations, and he wrote, literally wrote the book on ethical hacking. They've got a new search function that allows you to search all courses and videos for specific topics and quick answers. So, for example, if you want to find out more about DNS, you don't have to sit through an entire course on server setup. You can go to the, the two, three minutes that will describe the problem that you're having, and you can get your configuration fixed and running almost immediately. They've also got a virtual sandbox, which I really enjoy because it means that instead of having to buy those 
hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of equipment, you can try all the configurations in a virtual sandbox. It's, it's probably the best way to learn. Now, even if you're already studying with books or enrolled in a certification course, IT Pro TV is a great reference to have. It'll help you supplement the information you're learning in preparation for your exam. And they even include measure up practice ex exams with your subscription. That's a $79 value. A corporate and group pricing is available and clients right now include organizations like Harvard, MIT, UCSD, Stanford, and more. If they're willing to trust IT Pro TV to teach their students, I think you can trust them too. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to check out itpro.tv slash Windows Weekly, WW, and upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications recognized by employers everywhere. Subscriptions are normally $57 per month or $570 for the entire year, but we've got a special offer because they're friends of the Twit Army. You're going to get a seven-day free trial when you sign up using our offer code WW30. That's WW Windows Weekly 30, which will allow you to check out their courses, live stream, and more. You'll also receive 30% off the lifetime subscription of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. And this weekend next, IT Pro TV is recording its new courses on Microsoft Project, MCSA Server 2012, and their live streams will be available for free with the basic account. And you can watch live starting at 9.30 a.m. each weekend. Visit itpro.tv slash wwitpro.tv slash ww. And use the code Windows Weekly WW30 to try it free for seven days and save 30% off the lifetime of your account. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of Windows Weekly. Paul, we've hey. been waiting for this, <laughs> finally, <laughs> for Microsoft to get off their duffs and give us some information about the next generation of Surface. Okay, so let's move on to the next story. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I agree they have. I, I agree there's been a waste. So now we go back to Windows 10? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have something to add about Windows 10. No, okay. I, 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 I think it's fair to say that Microsoft's going to market with Surface Pro 3, you know, for Windows 10. And one thing they did say, I don't remember if it was at WPC this week or elsewhere, that uh, they will have Windows 10 pre-installed in Surface Pro 3. Um, so beyond that, you know, the one thing I've been telling people is, you know, uh, people emailing me and say, Paul, you know, I want to get Surface Pro 4, but I don't know when it's coming out. Do you think I should wait for it? Or should I just get a Surface Pro 3? And my response to that is, I have never heard about a Surface Pro 4. <laughs> I mean, uh, not, not that it can't happen without me, but, you know, the previous generations of Surface devices, I've heard about all of them ahead of time. And I, I have literally not heard a single thing about a Surface Pro 4. And somewhere inside Microsoft, there are people high-fiving themselves or something. I'm sure that was a, <laughs> a goal, you know. I don't know if it was Surface 2, Surface Pro 2, but... It was one gen when I had, I mean, I had everything, you know, down to the last pixel, but this time nothing. So I, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying there isn't one. I, I'm, in fact, I, obviously they'll make another Surface Pro device, um, but I think they saw some success with this one and they want to kind of keep it in market. I think it'd be nice at the very least if they just, you know, rev the chipset would be kind of a neat little thing to do for people, like kind of a midstream, you know, change the CPU type of thing like Apple does on their MacBooks. Um, but I've, I've heard nothing. No, we, we talked about it last week with Dr. Pizza. We said, yeah. we haven't heard anything firsthand about a Surface Pro 4, but I, I would be really surprised if we don't see Microsoft launch some kind of an updated Surface Pro 4 for the holiday. Mm -hmm. I, I would be very surprised. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the strange thing is, and, and again, yeah, Mary Jo, we talked about this last week. If they're planning on a holiday release, we no. should have heard at least some whispers from the channel on specs we're hearing right. none of that. Also, yeah. what about you're launching a, a major new version of your operating system, possibly the next lap for the last time ever? You're not going to ship the product right next to it. I mean, oh, really? because you know why? Because they're going to do that. I think here. This is my theory. October, because mm -hmm. we keep hearing the next version, the kind of a bigger update to Windows 10 is around October, oh. right? So then, if you're waiting for Threshold Two. And then suddenly you're like, hey, here's Threshold 2, and here's all this new hardware too. Maybe the band too. Mm -hmm. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, the new Surface. Maybe HoloLens. I don't sure. know about that one. But, you know, um, it, would, it would make a much bigger Big Bang kind of thing if you put all of that together. 
than if you kind of trickled it out. With I like it. I mean, I, I think the thing I would add too is uh, regardless of the reason, it's kind of a nice thing for Microsoft's PC maker partners who are not very excited about Surface right. to begin with. Right. To give sure. them the launch time. You know, uh, just that's hand, a good it, point. hand it to them, you know? Yep. It's just, a, a I'm just, I, I have yep. no knowledge that that's what they're doing, but it, it, but it does seem like a nice thing. Yep. It would yep. be nice, a nice way to, to start repairing the breach that they've created with some of their partners. Yeah. yeah. Who, who do feel a little left out. I just, I'm just yeah. going to throw that out there. But, mm -hmm. but we did actually, we, we did hear some surface news this week besides the preloading of Windows 10. They're finally expanding the channel, right? And that was a big piece of news here at the partner show because Right now, there aren't that many resellers that actually can carry the Surface. There are a few hundred worldwide. Um, they announced at the partner show over the next few months, they're going to expand that to a few thousand worldwide. So, you know, there are so many business customers who are like, we want to buy Surface in bulk for our users, but we need to buy it through resellers. We need authorized dealers. We need to sign large business contracts. And they haven't been able to find the resellers who are authorized to carry it. So now Microsoft's going to be expanding that. And to me, that also means they've solved some of their supply chain issues with the Surface if they're ready to do that. So that's really good news. That got a, that got a very warm reception here from the partners, I can tell you. Paul and Mary Joe, do we want to cover anything else before we move into listener Q&A? We haven't had a proper one of those because... I, I think I, we I need really to talk a little bit one. about Windows 10. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I mention two other partner announcements? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Okay. Um, and, and I want to mention these because I got a lot of questions about them here at the show. One of them I mentioned briefly when I talked about um, my interview with Satya, and that was the thing called Cortana Analytics Suite. Um, so coming this fall in preview, Microsoft's going to have this thing called Cortana Analytics Suite. And it's just what it sounds like. They're going to take all these backend services that you need for business intelligence, like HG Insight, which is Hadoop on Azure, Stream Analytics, um, Data Warehouse, Data Catalog, Data Factory, um, Machine Learning, and they're going to put a Cortana front end on this. So if you're somebody who is um, wrestling with, with generating data reports using all these backend tools in the cloud, you're going to be able to actually use Cortana and say, Cortana, get me the data on blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to be so much easier or type it into your machine if you don't want to say it um, in natural language form. So that's that's actually going to be really cool, I think, and get more people to try using these data services who've been very intimidated about forming queries and generating reports. So that's one that got announced here. The other one, I'm just going to mention it briefly just so people know. If you're an Office 365 customer and you're on E4, that plan, E4 is going to go away and it's going to be replaced by a new Office 365 SKU called E5. It's going to happen sometime later this year and it's going to add in a lot of those Skype for business features that Microsoft's testing right now. So things like Cloud PBX and the meeting broadcast. It's also going to add in Power BI Pro and Delve Organizational Analytics. So all those things are going to get swept up into a new version of Office 365 for businesses called E5. And right now we don't know how much that's going to cost, but I bet it's going to be more than E4, which is $22 per user per month. So that's that's your partner takeaways. Go partners. Go partners. Yep. Paul, last chance. Yeah. I know we haven't what talked about it much, but Windows 10. <laughs> Finally. One more time. I didn't think we were ever going to get to this. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we want to open up for some questions? Yeah. Sure. Let's. All right, so uh, you can pull from your Twitter accounts if you've got, but uh, Paul, I, I have an easy one for you from Lawn Dog. He wants to know when will your your book on Windows 10 be ready for purchase? <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope to, I, I think I'm going to be able to have it available by the 29th. Um, I don't know that it will be complete, but it should be at least a couple hundred pages long. Um, I work on it just about every day and, you know, we'll see. I, the, the tough part is that some of the, some of the details about installing and upgrading all that stuff are not going to become clear until the 29th, you know? So, I mean, I'll have something and then, it, you know, it will be updated. Regularly so you'll, you'll release service packs for, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Critical no, updates. this will be your Windows Critical. 10 book as a service. 
Mm -hmm. And they'll just <laughs> update it. Service, yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. That's right. Uh, and actually, we have another one from Omega Project. And this is uh, for, for either of you, for Paula or Mary Jo. If you had to explain to, let's say, a small business user or even an enterprise IT guy why he or she should update from Windows 7 to Windows 10, how would you couch it? Couch it. <laughs> Right. So, you know, I think this is a something that Microsoft's grappling with, too, because if you're running Windows 7 and you're a small business or a larger business and it's good enough, like why right now do you update to Windows 10? And right. here at the partner show um, during one of the keynotes, they played up the security aspects a lot. And this is something they haven't talked a ton about, I don't feel like. But they're adding all these new security features into Windows 10 kind of on, on the back end and under the covers that they've they've had a couple small smaller blog posts about these, but haven't talked uh, to a large extent about them yet. So like Hello and Passport and some of the other things they're doing around hardening the um, endpoints of the system. So I think if you really want to pitch it as a business operating system, those are the kinds of things that you're going to have to really sell because otherwise you're saying, you know what? Um, Windows 10. Yeah. It looks like they fixed Windows 8 and they're making it look more like Windows 7. That's not very compelling, right? Right. <laughs> not, not, not to a business at least. I mean, all I would say, first of all, I don't feel like it's my job to sell people on, <laughs> you know, like a <laughs> new version of Windows. Um, but obviously if you're using a traditional PC that's non-touch, that's a few years old, and you're using Windows 7. I mean, I, if things work, why would you bother? I mean, why why would you do that? Um, I think where Windows 10 makes the most sense is on new hardware and on uh, touch-enabled hardware, where all of a sudden you have these new interaction possibilities. And it's, it is possible that there were people who, or companies who bought Windows 8 class PCs, but reverted to Windows 8, uh, 7 because they didn't want the confusion there. And that those machines might have those touch capabilities. And um, I would ask them to uh, at least give that a shot and to take a look at that stuff because uh, you may you may think you don't want to touch the screen. And I know a lot of people think that uh, before they've actually tried it. But it's, um, this, what's that? <laughs> oh, including Mary Jo, that's right. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't replace anything. It's just additive. And I think it's one of the neat advantages that Windows has, you know, over its major... Uh, platform competitors like the Mac in particular, which has no touch, uh, or Chromebook, where, you know, obviously you, uh, they do have Chrome uh, touch devices, but it's still not very usual. We got another question here from Scott Michaud, who wants to know from either of you, what are your thoughts of using the HoloLens as a second or third monitor replacement? <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that one's for you, Mary Jo. Yeah, definitely. Um, no. I No. I'll a monitor replacement? Well, like for a laptop, so just being able to have a, a second or third monitor on the side of your laptop without actually having oh, to have oh, a second oh, or see. third monitor I on see. your laptop. I, I guess. You're, You're talking to someone who still uses a mouse, guys. <laughs> I, hey, I've, I've got a mouse. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I, Paul I'm, has a mouse. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm not like the futuristic category. I'm, I'm not. I'm like, if it works and it's not broken, I, I'm going to stick with it. Sorry. I'm not... I'm not very adventurous on that front. So no, I can't see myself sitting in my apartment wearing a hollow lens so that I can have another monitor. Sorry. Wow. Okay. I don't, yeah. And I don't actually think it's, um, I don't think it is a second monitor replacement in, in any scenario. It's, it's more of a picture in picture kind of a thing. Um, okay. you know, are, are there advantages to, I mean, I guess you could say, in other words, uh, you could project a virtual display up on the wall that you can't see behind my screen here. And maybe that virtual, the screen could have weather information on it or news updates or, you know, things like that. And maybe, I mean, I think the limited field of view of the device would, would limit that kind of peripheral vision anyway. Um, I, I don't think of it as second screen. I, I think there's some augmented reality scenarios that are really cool. I mentioned one earlier where, you know, you've got basically a little Skype window that, you know, in your vision is kind of up here in the corner. And you could even, you know, drag it around as you need to because you're working with something in the real world. Um that kind of stuff is interesting. I, I don't think of it as a, you know, you're not going to be snapping windows to it or anything. I don't think it's that kind of a uh, usage scenario. Yeah. We've got a question for Paul from Friendly Manitoba. He wants to know if you are completely and forever done with physical books. Hmm. Uh, making physical books? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, never say never, but I, I the, the transition I made was that over the course of the last two books I worked on with Wiley, and, and Wiley's a great uh, publisher. I mean, I don't have any animosity toward them, but I, I really tried to push them on ebooks and being able to update the book. And it's very expensive when you come out with a book to, um, you know, to update it. And if you if something wrong is in the book or if something changes with the product and now the book is wrong, these things are just sitting out there in bookstores and you're kind of screwed. Um, and so, you know, for the first books, you know, the, the first Windows book certainly that I did with Raphael or the, some of the smaller books I did by myself, you try to work with, well, let's work with ebook publishers and let, let's see what that's like, in addition to being able to provide things directly to people. And it's awful. And I think part of the reason it's awful is for the same reason that, you know, writing an article for the print magazine, which I used to do a few years back, compared to writing an article for my blog, which I can instantly publish, is wonderful. Um, it's just a lack of control. And so what I what I discovered, and Raphael agrees, we, you know, we discovered, I guess, over the course of the Windows 8.1 book was just do it yourself, you know, it, and, and so, I, I mean, I'll, I, who knows, there might be Mary Jo and I are going to write a book about Microsoft someday. She denies it, but it will happen. Nope. And maybe that will nope. be on paper. I nope. <laughs> <laughs> you can please uh, just mute her microphone. Nope. She doesn't know. She's not in her right frame of mind right now. But well, anyway, if a publisher came to you and said, Mary Jo, Paul, here's a yeah. million dollars each. We want right. to make a lot of printed books. You'd, you'd yep. probably do it. I, print it. Then printed books would be great. <laughs> but, but I mean, for the type of books that I do, it just makes sense for me to write them and 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 uh, give them to people directly, just like I do on my website. You know, okay. there will be mistakes, but I can fix them. Yeah. You know, uh, we actually have. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how uh, how much you've played with the uh, video game streaming from the Xbox One. Uh, have mm -hmm. you have you played with that with that build at all? I haven't. I haven't, unfortunately, because I'm not on the preview program for oh, some okay. reason. Even though I used to be. Oh, really. So yeah. Actually, I just yeah. checked that. I I've been knocked off as well since the last yep, time I downloaded. Yep, silently gone. Yeah, I had no idea why. Hmm. All right. Huh. Well, cool. Yep. So, uh, so you wouldn't be able to answer whether or not you can stream Xbox One games over the to, yeah, because to obviously what? you have many. Well, I mean, to, I can talk about it generally. To a mean? Windows 10 PC. So uh, the idea was to be able to. Well, to yeah, I mean that's the point. That's enabled now. If you're a, if you are a, an Xbox tester, or whatever that's called, whatever that Insider program is called, um, that is enabled now. You can stream Xbox One games to, and I guess soon through emulation, Xbox 360 games. Uh, to a Windows PC. There are limitations on it, though. I mean, I, I, I kind of always imagined that the point behind this would be someone's out in the living room watching movies on Netflix and you could be in your office on your PC playing a game that's being streamed from the Xbox. But apparently you can't actually do those two things at the same time. So um, I don't have it to test, but... Got it. I have a question I could ask here from Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um. Farshad asks, what's going to happen to Connect? Are they going to continue working on it or discontinue it? I think they're going to keep it. Yeah, um, I do too. You know, they've, they've combined it so that you use the same Connect now for Windows devices as you use for the Xbox One. Uh, but it feels like they are not pushing it as actively to me as they used to, um, that it's kind of more almost like HoloLens in a way, like we're going to let people develop custom applications, especially business applications. Um, and if people want to do games using Connect, sure. But um, now that they've decoupled the mandatory requirement to have Connect with Xbox One, I, I feel like it's kind of taking a backseat to the other peripherals that they have coming in the future. Actually, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good point because the new Connect actually has some amazing capabilities that go way beyond gaming, but they ran into such an issue with the, the privacy kerfuffle that it's almost as if Microsoft is now gun-shy. They're saying, well, fine, we don't do input devices. We mm -hmm. do HoloLens. Yep. All right. Uh, actually, oh, here's a good one. We got this one from Dr. Horston. Question for both of you. Uh, if he installs the latest, the uh, the supposedly the RTM version, 10, uh, 240, to a fresh computer where he accepts the upgrade from Windows 7 to 8 in the upgrade app during the install, would he then be able to activate it on the 29th or would he have to do a fresh installation before he runs that wizard? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, hmm. He should be able I to. Don't know. It's, it's just as a service, right? Well, it's hard to say. So it's, um, we're recording a podcast and I've uh, triggered the download and... A restart has been has been scheduled on my PC, and when we're done here, I will install this build and see what that looks like. So, 
Um, uh, my, I mean, will this thing remain activated? I don't know. I haven't installed it yet, so I can't really say. Ask I guess next the week, Dr. Horston, and he'll be able to tell you exactly <laughs> well, how that we're works. asking about an hour. <laughs> you okay. know, I, I, I guess I guess the worst case scenario is I'd be surprised if this were the case, but I suppose it's possible because remember they had uh, keys for the pre-install uh, the pre-release builds, and those keys will not work on this build. And so I take that to mean you can't do a clean install, not an upgrade, but I presume if you uh, have Windows 8.1 or are on an existing Insider build and you upgrade, you'll retain that activation. Uh, if not, then the worst case scenario is it's two weeks to July 29th, and at the very least, you'll be able to get your you know, your activation at that point. And, and I suppose what that might mean is that you're not going to be doing any lock uh, screen customization or whatever, you know, because, so, you know, so certain features are turned off if you're not activated. Um, but I, I, I mean, I'm just guessing. I, I assume if you are upgrading, it will just work. Right. Yeah. And there's no reason for them not to have their activation servers up and running by the 29th. It, it's not like they well, don't uh, have Well, yeah, I mean, the activation it. servers are up and running. I guess it's more of a, a, a question of, you know, how, how that activation happens and, and, I don't, you know, I don't know. We don't just don't. This right. is what you know. You asked about the book earlier. This is one of those things. That I have to experience it before I can really say. For, I don't want to state something definitively. I really don't know. Right, makes sense. Anything else? The the chat room is now just telling me that you need to talk more about Windows 10. So I think they're done. <laughs> yeah. I have a good question. Well, it's clear here's some people get it. <laughs> here's, here's here's a non Windows 10 question. Dreyer Smith. Uh, do you think Microsoft will use their existing MO for selling phones in the future or go the surface route with limited market availability? So we know a little bit about that, right? We know yep. um, going forward that Microsoft has said they're going to cut back on the geographies and the carrier relationships where they have not had success with Windows right. Phone. So before you completely panic, they say they are going to stay in the U.S., somehow. But I, I do worry about Verizon, I have to say. Um, Verizon's been very non-cooperative partner on Windows Phone, and AT&T has been a much better partner for them, as has T-Mobile. So maybe they'll stay in the U.S. and have fewer carriers, and maybe that same thing will be true in other countries as well. They'll keep a carrier and get rid of some of the others. So I think there will be definitely, because fewer phones, more limited availability. Um, and they've got to kind of focus on where their areas of strength are. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think there's it's going to be much more focused, I would say. I don't know if Paul wants to add to that. No, I, I, that's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, Paul, yeah. we got a question for you from uh, J.C. Calhoun. He wants to know if um, Windows 10 Universal apps will have separate volume controls. They can. <laughs> I mean, in other words, will, will the, I mean, for the example, the there. music, the Groove Music app has its own uh, volume control. If you're referring to the, um, the volume, the system volume control, whether there'll be a, you know, a, a, a UI for individual apps or whatever, um, that's actually not part of, actually, yes, it is. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> I was going to say that's not part of Windows 10. Actually, yes, it is. But uh, there's a third party app, which I, I assume, no, he's not. I was going to say, uh, Raphael uh, was, uh, promoting an app that adds that uh, kind of like a like I guess I should say universal looking uh, volume control for each of the separate apps uh, to the tray, and I'll I'll see if I can find that. Hopefully he's listening, and I can get a a URL to him um, that will you know basically I think give give him the capability he's looking for. But universal apps can have their own volume controls. I know that only because the the Groove Music app does have its own volume control that is separate from system volume. Right, right. I, yeah, I think. He's interested in being able to to set separate volumes for apps that don't include it inside their UI. Yeah, like it would be, be nice, nice to mute an app. Yes, you know, and, and well, there's a volume mixer. I mean, it's the same volume mixer that's always been in Windows. Um, and in fact, let me let me test it <laughs> since we're talking about it and open the volume mixer. What well, while Paul do? is testing that, Mary Jo, here's a quick one for you. So, uh, okay. several people have asked, uh, does Sacha drink beer, and did you offer him one? <laughs> you know, nice. I don't know if, if he drinks beer, and I did not offer him one. Since we were doing our interview around um, noon, I mean, I could have, I guess, but no. <laughs> All right, back to Paul. Paul, verdict? All right, so it appears that the <laughs> – I'm sure this person knows this because they asked the question. 
It looks like the volume mixer in Windows 10 doesn't mix. Oh. I was going to say modern apps, but um, um, they took it the out. Universal apps. Oh. So uh, there's a third party app called Ear Trumpet. Um, you can look for it on GitHub. I'm getting a tiny URL anytime soon, but uh, it's called Ear Ear Trumpet, and it will add, it adds that it's a, a volume mixer for Universal apps. It's not going to be part of Windows though. That's it for Q&A. Uh, can we move on to some picks and tips and mm -hmm. all those other good things that we do at the end of the show? Yep. Sure. Who's first? I guess I'm first. My tip is that we need to talk more about Windows 10. <laughs> and... <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> yep, sausage and oysters. That's my whole life. <laughs> So, no, I, I, you know, I wrote a little bit about uh, Windows Phone this week and, and what, you know, do we stick with this platform or we were so worried about it that we abandoned, you know, Windows Phone? You know, what do you do about Windows Phone? Um, and obviously your situation is going to vary according to your own needs, according to the timing of your, your you know, maybe your mobile contract is up and you don't want to wait months for a new, um, you know, flagship phone that may or may not appear for Microsoft. You know, what do you do? That kind of thing. But, you know, for I, I try to be very realistic and honest about what's happening with the Windows Phone. But in doing so, you also have to say that the flip side is that it's not going anywhere. You know, Mary Jo and uh, Satya Nadella talked about that this week, that Microsoft will continue making Windows Phone handsets themselves. They would prefer for partners to kind of create a rich ecosystem of devices. But if they don't do that, he specifically said Microsoft will fill the gap and they will do it themselves. I mean, today, obviously, they're really filling the gap. They're about 97% of all phone, you know, Windows phones in use. But, you know, hopefully over the next year or whatever, you know, we do see that thing, which I did expect to see happen by now, which is more OEMs come on board and actually sell devices that people, you know, buy and use. Um, but the, anyway, the point of the tip here is just that uh, I would just, if you're a fan of Windows phone, I mean, it's not time to give up hope yet. I would wait and see. I mean, nothing is... Uh, changing such that you have to make a change right now. Like, oh, it's all over. I'm going to go buy an iPhone. There's no reason to kind of knee jerk uh, on that yet. Um, I personally am going to stick with Windows Phone. I'm very interested to see what these uh, flagship uh, premium phones that they come out with. Uh, I'm curious if they do anything with branding. You know, maybe we'll see an actual Surface phone, which a lot of people have been asking for. And I think actually there's uh, some rationale to using that brand because it is a more successful brand than Lumia uh, in particular, at least here in the United States. And uh, so... You know, I, I, I mean, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting a very, what I think is a very realistic, at least very honest view of what's happening with this market. But I, I also think that as bad as it is, there's no reason to just, you know, give it up and, and walk away from it. Um, if you could use Windows Phone, there's no reason to keep you not to keep using it. If you had to use iPhone or Android because certain apps were there or whatever the reasons might be, those reasons are all the same. That nothing has changed. So, you know, just don't, don't, don't give up on it completely. Um, the other thing I, uh, oh, then the uh, software pick, I just wanted, actually, there are two of them. And interestingly, I just discovered that they both have uh, very similar requirements. Uh, Microsoft this week released the final version of Office 2016 for the Mac. Um, initially, it's only available to Office 365 subscribers. And that's true if you're on the cons a consumer one, like Office 365 Home or Personal, or any of the business SKUs, including, I think, uh, Office 365 Pro Plus. Pro Plus, is that right? Plus Pro? Pro, Pro Plus? Pro Plus. Um, Pro Plus. Pro Plus. Uh, I think I think it's September. Uh, you'll be able to just buy it in a box if you just want to buy a one-off copy or that kind of thing. Um, Microsoft today released new versions of the Universal Office mobile apps for Windows 10. Um, they haven't. They didn't really announce anything at the time, but if you look at the app now in Windows 10, what you'll see is that the preview tag is gone. It's kind of the final version. Um, it's you know it's out and it's ready to roll, but. As part, I think it was in the Windows 10 uh, Build 20, uh, 240 uh, blog post, they mentioned some licensing changes for these apps. And on PCs and tablets, those apps will require an Office 365 subscription. So in the future, when you buy a Windows 10 mobile phone, you will get those Office mobile apps, which is Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote, and also uh, you know the Outlook apps that come with the system for free. But if you have... Uh, a PC or a tablet, uh, you'll need an Office 3, uh, 365 subscription. So they're available now, but now there's this new licensing requirement. And actually, Mary Jo, I should ask you, um, do you know 
if they had they previously said that that was going to be the case for the the universal office of mobile apps that they'd be available on the 29th no that they would require an office 365 subscription on oh. pcs and tablets so um you know what? it's gonna i think it's going to be exactly like it is on um android and ios which is if um you only want to the um i think this is true on that it, there's so many versions of offices, it's hard to keep this straight. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's if you're on a tablet of a certain screen size, that it's yeah, completely right. free, okay. right? And okay. then if you're not, there's still a free version. But if you want to have all the features unlocked, you have to pay th via an Office 365 subscription. I think that's how it's going to be. Isn't seven inch the cutoff? Seven inch um, and below is free. Or is it? Um, is it ten point two? <laughs> Ten point one. You know 10. what? 2. Here's the problem. It's actually different for Office than it is for Windows. Oh, fantastic. So, oh, right, it is. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So Windows, the the desktop versions of Windows, I think it's eight inches and up. So for it to get Windows 10 Mobile, you need to have 7.99 inches or lower. And I think we, and now you're triggering my memory. I believe for Office, it is screen size, and I think it's 10 point 10 inches or 10.1 inches or 10 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yep. You think those two teams maybe want to just sit down and have a little <laughs> chat? You know, I, you got to keep things interesting. <laughs> so at some point, I will have a device that is free for one package and not for another. That's just yeah. already guaranteed. Yep. Oh, good, there good, go. good, fantastic. Mary Jo, you promised us some gig jam, or is it jig gam? I can't remember. Whatever. Some of this wonderfully named product talk. Yes, gig jam. G-I-G-J-A-M, a name only Paul Therat could love. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a fever dream. <laughs> it, it's just a very odd name to me, but uh, it's, awesome. it's a very interesting product, actually. They showed it off here at the Partner Show. And what Gig Jam is, it's both a service and lightweight apps that are going to be available on Windows, iOS, and Android. And what it does, so here, here's how to think about it. It, Microsoft says it's software that's for getting work done, right? Okay, well, that's that's a pretty broad mission statement. But say you're on a team and say you're somebody who's trying to close an order with a customer. You're in the middle of doing the order. You pull it down. You're working on your PC and then you're like, oh, I need to find out from John, um, you know, did, did we give this customer a deal in the past or how do we work with them? So usually what you do is then you email John, you have to wait for John to email you back and you can't get the work done. This is a lightweight service where it spins up conversations on the fly with people. So if John's available, you would maybe tap into Skype and just talk to him real quick. Like, Hey, I'm doing this order. Can you tell me about blah? Yeah, here you go. Or if he's not available, gets the message to him, you get it back in this, in this kind of lightweight almost Snapchat like app where after you have this interaction with the person, that app disappears. Um, there's a whole bunch of complicated and, and some non-complicated technology on the back. Uh, and in short, they use REST APIs to connect all of these different pieces so that they interoperate. Uh, so it's not using the Skype backbone. It's just using HTTP as the backbone. And Microsoft's making it so you can plug in all these different apps. So if you're using say Salesforce or SAP, or you're using um, another uh, communication service, all these different things are going to be able to talk to each other using REST calls, OAuth um, for managing credentials. You'll be able to plug in Active Directory, but you won't have to use Active Directory. Uh, so it's, it's just an idea of creating this new service that's a combination of a lot of different Microsoft and non-Microsoft services so that you can get your work done no matter what kinds of applications you're using to get the work done. And if that sounds complicated, it's way more complicated when you see their explanation. That was my easy explanation of Gig Jam. Um, it's not available yet in preview, but I think it's coming fairly soon. So um, there's a if you go to gigjam.com, you can sign up there to have information sent to you when the preview is available if you want to try it out. Okay, Paul, do, do you get it? I know. Hmm? It's hard. To, it's kind of hard to explain this thing, I, I, mean, I have I'm, to say. I, I, hmm? I understand the pieces you're talking about. I'm still not picturing how this thing's supposed to work. It makes yeah, playlists think... from the music that you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think know. it's, you know what, it's one of those things you have to see either a demo or actually watch somebody 
use the prototype in person. But you were it's impressed really when you, when you saw it. You said, "Okay, this is a good product." I it, and you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what. Forget what I thought of it. The partners who were at this show when they saw the demo, they were like. Wow. Everybody applauded. They were like, that is what I want. Like it got a really very positive reception by the audience, I have to say. And I can't get a preview of this yet? Nope, not yet. Not, <sighs> not till, I would say a few, a few, maybe a month plus away, but um, sign up, sign up to get the information on giggem.com. You can try it out. Maybe, maybe the name was delivered. Maybe it's the product with the worst possible name that's going to surprise you because it's incredibly awesome. <laughs> it, you know why they call it gig jam? It's like they, they actually want gig jam to become a verb the way Skype is a verb. Like gig jam me. No. <laughs> I will uh. never, I will never say uh. gig jam me ever. I can uh. say that now. They actually said oh. they do want it to become a verb. When I heard them say that, I was like, no, guys, no. But but the reason they call it gig jam is it's like you're doing your gig. In other words, you're doing your work and you and need to jamming. jam with other people. Or, oh, That's why. Okay. No. <laughs> Guys, I don't make up the product names. I just write about them. Uh, speaking of product names, you've got a code name pick. Yeah, this is a great code name. Um, Windows Central brought this one to my attention. The code name is Munchkin. And um, Munchkin was first discovered by Microsoft Insider.es, and then uh, Windows Central found out some more information about it. So, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of demos of Cortana, I mean, I mean, not Cortana, of Continuum for phone, right? But how does that work when you're trying to plug in a keyboard and a monitor? So what Munchkin seems to be, according to Windows Central, is something almost like a docking station. It's going to include a selection of ports for your USB peripherals and your displays, and it's going to connect to a hub so that this is how this is how Continuum with a phone is actually going to connect to your keyboards and your displays. It's, it's almost like a docking station, they think. Um, so that's that's all we know about it right now, but the code name is just pretty fun. So that's my code name pick of the week. Munchkin. I want to do some uh, inside baseball here. Uh, okay. I, I saw at the bottom of the document for most of the show, beer pick of the week, Mary Jo asking Paul, do you have anything? And Paul just doing, oh, yeah, and smiley face. So I'm assuming <laughs> that's a good thing, right, Paul? It is a good thing. Actually, I, let me just follow up on the office thing we were talking about earlier. Back in March, Microsoft blogged that uh, they are classifying anything with a screen size of 10.1 inches or less to be a true mobile device. So if you have a screen bigger than that, technically you have to pay for Office 365 to get the, you know, to get the uh, mobile apps. So if my screen is large enough to be useful, I need to pay for it. Exactly. Got it. All right. And for whatever it's worth, I mean, if you're using Office 365, I mean, you want the desktop versions of the apps <laughs> on a, you know, on a computer. You're gonna, you can choose either one. Like, right? why wouldn't you use the, um, you know, the real thing? I guess. Not that I don't right. want to use PowerPoint on a three-inch screen, but yeah, I think I'll pay. Sure. It. <laughs> sure. Oh, and, so, and this just in. Can I add one more tip? There you go. Yep. Gabe All, yeah, the head of the RT. Windows Insider program, just tweeted to someone, Windows 8.1 RT Update 3, which I guess is yep. the subset of the Windows 10 features, will be available in September. So all you guys, long-suffering guys and gals running Windows RT on ARM-based devices. You you will get an update in September of I, some kind. I have a Windows RT device. I, I, I would say I'm Me running too. it. Uh, I'm still using mine. It's plugged in. It's got power. I saw one on the train today, by the way, an RT device. Really? <laughs> like Surface RT. I'm not kidding. Was it being used as a computer? Yeah, it was hold no, it was holding on the open the door to the That's bathroom. What I thought. No, somebody no, somebody no, no, someone was using it. I I I Yeah. I use mine amazing. sometimes still. Yeah, that that little tidbit was sent to me by Thinnis Swart, who's listening. So thank you. Yeah, I just yeah, I just saw that as well. Yep. Yep. So uh yeah, important I the last business. two shows. Yes. Yeah, the important business. Um I, I was away in Ireland and um I've been to Ireland several times, but I actually I haven't been there in seven or eight years. And I think on this show I I, I made a comment about how strange it was to me that Ireland has always had this wonderful pub scene. They always had, you know, fairly terrible beers. And it's not that, you know, Guinness is terrible per se. It's just that you basically have Guinness. You have like an Irish beer that's just like Guinness. And then you have a couple of, you know, like you have a Heineken beer and, you know, and that's kind of the whole beer selection. It was just kind of uninspirational, especially when you think about how awesome that the craft beer scene has been, especially here in the United States. 
uh, after saying that, I heard from a couple of people said, actually, um, there is a, a, a very nice craft beer scene that's occurred in Ireland. It must have occurred since I was there last time. And I got some emails about that, but I got a particularly nice email um, from Brian Condren, who before the trip gave me a, a very lengthy description of craft beer places I could go and craft beers to try and and on and on and on. So much so that I said, look, we got to, you know, meet up and I'll buy, I'll buy you a beer and we'll, we'll, we'll check some of this stuff out. And so when we were in Dublin, my wife and I went over and met him. And um, one of the big breweries that he's a big fan of is called Galway Bay Brewery. And uh, they're, you know, based out of Galway. And um, we, uh, we, <laughs> we tried every single one of the beers that they had um, in Dublin, which I think was 12 or 13. And when we later went to Galway, we went to one of their, one of their, their own breweries, or I'm sorry, one of their own uh, pubs. And uh, we had the beer that I'm recommending if you're lucky enough to be able to find it, um, which is, it's called In Bloom, uh, Gor uh, Gorse Flower Wit, uh, mm -hmm. Galway Bay Brewery. Uh, when I had it, it was only available in Galway. You could, uh, in fact, Brian, I <laughs> emailed it to him and he said, I can't even find this here. It, it, mm -hmm. it had just come out. And uh, it's, you know, it's a Hefeweizen type w uh, wheat beer. It's kind of, it, it is the perfect wheat beer it's perfect and uh i my initial this dates back to my very beginnings with craft beer back when i lived in phoenix we used to go to a local brewery and they made a hefeweizen which i to this day consider perfection of this kind of beer and um you know that kind of banana and kind of uh, cinnamon you know uh, undertaste that's in there it's just perfect and um those guys, unfortunately, were very small. They went out of business, and we couldn't, then we moved anyway. And so I spent many years trying to find a beer that was that good. And I found a few that are they're very, very close. I would say this one's the best one by far. Um, so you know, travel good. to Ireland. Yeah, have some, have some <laughs> craft beer in Ireland. <laughs> uh, Paul, Mary Jo has been helping me to, to start an appreciation for beer. I've yep. already learned that I, I don't like stouts. Uh, that tasted, yeah, smelled horrible. Sure. And uh, thanks to my brother, I also know that I think Corona is possibly the worst thing I've ever tasted in my life. Corona is what water is to water. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. okay, okay, good. So is this, what's a wheat beer? What, what does that mean? So it's, it's, a, it, it's a lighter, but un, it's a, an unfiltered light beer. Okay. It's, it's actually the perfect starting point for craft beer because it's not crazy enough to be weird to people that are used to just standard American type, you know, Pilsners or whatever. Um, it, but it's, it, it is a step above what I would think of as like a clear, a clear beer. And I guess I would say a filtered beer, which is typically before craft, you know, beer became a big deal again here in the United States was typically what we would drink. If you drink like a Budweiser or a Miller, you know, whatever, these are heavily filtered, very clean beers and a wheat beer, this kind of a wit beer or a, a half a Weizen type beer is typically, you know, it's unfiltered and it's, uh, there's a, usually a spice element to it. Um, Ooh, okay. And, you know, again, there's like a banana taste, which is not because there are bananas in it. I believe that's actually from the yeast that they use or from the uh, yes. uh, combination of yeast and hops and so forth. But um, it's it's kind of a nice entry point. And the, the interesting thing about your comment about stouts is that if you do make some kind of a journey through craft beer and you go from beers to beers, you try different beers, saisons and sours and all of the types of beers that are available – you're going to circle back to stouts, and I think you're going to have a different appreciation for that kind of beer later than you do now because part of it is just opening up the palate to these new tastes. And, you know, my wife and I um, don't actually like stouts all that much, but I can kind of appreciate stouts on a different level, and we'll try them at least. Um, whereas, you know, I think if you would just went straight to a stout from Budweiser, it would be, you know, it would be an unnatural act. I'm, I'm never. I'm not going to say never, never stout, because, but it's yeah. going to be a pretty big yeah. circle because my stout ended up on the person in front of me at AT and T Park because it was. That's too bad. Really, That's it just bad. it hit me, and I'm like, I don't. And, want And this then when mouth. they turned around and freaked at you, you could you could have said, Hey, you know what? At least it's not a Corona. No, I gave them my stout, <laughs> and if everything was fine. I'm like, I'm sorry about that. You Here, literally you gave them all of it. Yeah, and they're like, All right, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and Mary Jo, we don't have an audible pick of the week, do we? Uh, I don't think we do. Okay. Paul usually does the audible pick if there is one. Yeah, I only do the audible pick if they're sponsoring the show. So, well, I, I got to say this has been a lot of fun. I, I've I've uh, really enjoyed myself with Mary Jo the last two weeks, and to have you back for the third week and the final week because Leo will be back next week was just a yep. lot of fun. Thank you both very very much. Thank yeah, you. it was, it was great good having you. you. 
Folks, don't forget that you can find Windows Weekly every Wednesday on the Twit TV network at, uh, when, when do we start? What is that, 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock a.m. or so. Live.twit.tv. Sorry to interrupt. Can I ask you a question? Yes, you can. Um, are you a very tiny person or is that a giant mug on the desk? No, I'm actually, I'm three feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, is actually um, not the regular set that, that we use for That is the Twit. size of a human head. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you know, people have never seen me actual size, but I had to use Leo's regular mug and, yeah. They call Jeez. me Father Oompa Loompa. It's, it's like a gallon with a, with a handle on it. <laughs> this is actually how I would probably <laughs> you know. drink beer out of something like yeah. this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like a pint of coffee, I guess. <laughs> if you want your pint of Twit, don't forget that you can find us uh, live.twit.tv. Also, as long as you're going to watch us live, go ahead and jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv. It's a great way to give feedback to the host, maybe even to, uh, to, to possibly present us with... Uh, uh, you know, a, a question or two for the question and answer period. Also, <laughs> you can find us wherever <laughs> fine podcasts are uh, aggregated. Nice, nice. Yes, uh, this is my wow. teacup. So, yes, <laughs> that's like the uh, the Michael Myers movies. Like, excuse me, I ordered the large, you know, uh, cappuccino or whatever. Oh yeah, uh, evidently we use it to store chocolate, so it's not going to be around here for very long. Of course, of course, you can find Paul Therat at the Wind Super Site or Therat.com. Uh, Paul, is is there another way that you like people to get in touch with you? You like emailing them, emailing you, maybe I, calling I you at night. I live a hermit-like existence. You could use telegrams. Um, you know, I'm on Twitter <laughs> at Thrott. And uh, of course, Mary Jo Foley can be found at the. Uh, I'm going to do it again because I, I think it's tradition now at the All About Android blog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He actually yep. said that. The I first, said that the first, first day. Time. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All about Microsoft, of course, CDNet. Uh, if you want to see the full interview that she had with Sachin Adela, you have to stop in. It's very interesting to, stuff. We, we, we did a very surface treatment. You're going to see people referencing that, that interview for the next m few months. So go ahead and do yourself a favor. Drop by and actually read the full transcript. Uh, Leo Laporte will be back next week along with, uh, uh, well, no, he doesn't have a TD, does he, uh, Alex? It's just himself. It's just himself. So uh, until then... <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye to both Mary Jo Foley and Paul Therott. Thank you for stopping by Windows Weekly. See you next week. <laughs>